<clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's been a while. My name is Joe, um, Pastor Joe. For so many years, I was a uh, I was a Wesleyan pastor in Western New York and West Michigan and Chicago and. For 35 years, I had the privilege of being a, a, a Wesleyan pastor, raised two boys that are both Wesleyan pastors, serving around the country, and so it's a, it's a joy to be able to, uh, to share with you today. But I got, I got to admit, before I start, that I feel a little bit rusty. I, I was counting, and it's been at least a year and a half since I've been uh, here in the pulpit, and I'm not sure that I know how to do this anymore. Um, <laughs> It's like, it's like riding a bicycle, they say, although I feel as nervous as I did the first time I ever stood before a congregation. So bear with me today. You know, every Sunday we begin our service by reminding uh, one another of the purpose here at FCC, and I like it up here on the board. You don't have it uh, on your screen, but it's, it's all about the one, isn't it? It's all about the one, having faith in one Savior, Jesus Christ, and following after Christ as one of his disciples, and living out our faith by loving one another, right? Well, today I want us to pause and think about that last point. One of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples was this, love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. That's found in John uh, 13, 35. On another occasion, he had said, a tree is known by the fruit it produces. Now, Francis Schaeffer was a theologian back in the 60s who made a huge impact on that generation. And in his book, The Church at the End of the 20th Century, he stated this. He said, Jesus left his disciples with one distinctive mark that would ultimately testify to the whole world of the genuineness of their faith. He said, if we expect non-Christians to know that we are Christians, we must show the mark. Well, the mark that he was speaking of is none other than love and grace, the fruit of the Spirit. So here's my question for us today. Are we as Christians, especially in this pandemic world we now live in, are we known by people outside the church by the mark of love and grace? Is grace the mark of Fellowship Community Church? Well, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Phil Yancey asked this disturbing question. He said, how is it that Christians called to dispense the aroma of amazing grace instead pollute the world with the noxious fumes of ungrace? If grace so is so amazing, why don't Christians show more of it? Amen. Well, that's a hard statement, isn't it? I mean, really. Yes, he was referring to the general perception in our culture that Christians, evangelical Christians in particular, rather than being marked by grace, tend to be marked by intolerance and bigotry. A charge not entirely unfounded in light of the way many Christians have acted and reacted to emotionally charged issues like homosexuality and abortion and, and euthanasia. Well, I mean, just take a moment to listen to the mean-spirited words that are often used, the accusations that are blindly hurled at the other side, and a general lack of compassion and understanding for those who are caught in the web of dilemmas that these issues pose. And unfortunately, the LGBTQ community, Planned Parenthood, and liberal politicians are not the only ones on the receiving end of our ungrace, as Yancey calls it. This COVID pandemic that we're coming through has shined a light on this issue for me. All over the country today, it seems people are angry. They're angry with one another about having to quarantine themselves. 
They're angry with the government for not having the foresight to better prepare for a global pandemic. They're angry at having to wear a mask. They're angry at being pressured to get immunized. They're angry, really angry now, over the price of gas and other commodities. And all of this anger over COVID has only sparked more and more hostility over our racial and political differences with riots against the police, attacks on the Capitol, and brutal attacks against people of Asian descent. Sadly, Christians have been right in the middle of much of this anger, even self-righteously justifying it. And I am more and more convinced that as Christians, we are generally deficient in demonstrating grace because we have a poor understanding of the grace that God has shown us and the grace that he instills within us to live graciously toward others. Let me read the text that I've chosen for today from John, 1 John chapter 4. He writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You see... Grace, according to this text right here, it, grace is born in us through an act of God. That word grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means a friendly disposition from which a kindly act proceeds. Grace is both defined as well as demonstrated in the very character and work of God himself, who, who, who is the very definition of love and who demonstrated that love when he sent his own son to die for us while we were still sinners not while we were good people but while we were sinners he died for us we call that love amazing grace and it is amazing it's amazing because we don't deserve it huh it's amazing because we don't deserve it. The Bible says that instead of grace, we all really deserve God's wrath because of our sin. However, God chose to let the punishment for our sin fall on his son Jesus instead. And it's amazing because it's so transforming. The Bible declares that we are transformed from death to life, from sinner to saint from objects of wrath to being children of God. And it's amazing because it is absolutely free. There is nothing we can do to deserve it or to earn it. The only thing we can do is to gratefully receive it. And by it, I mean him. Well, the Apostle John said in our text, we love because he first loved us. The only reason that we can love is because God loved us first. Now, I think you probably know the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, think about this. The only reason we can ever obey that commandment is because God loved us first. Because he loved us first. The ancient Hebrews learned to love God because God demonstrated his love toward them by delivering them from slavery to Egypt and giving them a land that is their own. Well, instead of rescuing us from slavery to a foreign power, 
God has rescued us from slavery to sin. At the cross of Jesus, then, God's gracious act of love took on a universal application. He chose to save us while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, rescuing us from the clutches of Satan's destructive designs. And so now, as a result of God's grace in us, we're free to love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our might in return. And then, because of his amazing grace toward us, we're able to obey his second command as well, and that is to love our neighbor as ourselves. You see, the seeds of grace are actually planted right within us when we become born again. As recipients of his grace, for by grace are we saved through faith, we carry around within us, just like DNA, the code for becoming just as gracious as the very one who gave his life for us. Indeed, God's very purpose in saving us was so that we might ultimately be conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, whenever we receive the gift of his forgiveness and eternal life, then we also become new creatures growing day by day in his likeness and holiness. That's what the discipleship is, being a, being a disciple, growing in his likeness every day. And consequently, the love God showed to us is supposed to spill out to others. That's why the Apostle Paul said to the Romans, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And so as recipients of his grace, then God expects his children that we will become dispensers of grace. We become the means by which other people understand that God loves them. How do they know God loves them? Because we are loving them. Jesus said in the same way that a tree is ultimately known by the fruit it produces, so his disciples would be known by the love they showed one another. Christians must care for one another and love one another on a far different level than the world to actually love their neighbors the same way they love themselves. And my neighbor, he demonstrated in his famous parable of the Good Samaritan, is anybody who has needs and to whom we extend grace and mercy. <laughs> Doesn't have to be someone in our immediate circle, in our family, in our church. It's anybody we see who has needs and to whom we demonstrate grace. Jesus taught his disciples that even that the grace and mercy they showed was not just reserved for believers, but even for our enemies as well. But you know, I fear that one of the reasons we have difficulty in dispensing grace is because grace becomes distorted in our minds and in our hearts when we, when we only focus on the law of God. Now, I think a lot of people have a tendency to miss out on grace in their own lives because all they understand is the law of God. And consequently, they either think of themselves as being wholly unworthy of God's favor and so work hard to gain it, or else they perceive of themselves as being not all that bad and consequently actually deserving of God's favor. In either case, we fail to see that God has already done it all for them, and he offers his forgiveness as a free gift, not as something to be earned. Nobody will ever be good enough to merit God's favor. Peter Kreeft, in his book, Back to Virtue, said, There are no good people. And the best of us say so most clearly. <laughs> saints agree that they are sinners. Only sinners think they are saints. Only fools demand justice. For where would we be if we got it? No, mercy is our only hope from God. And our neighbor's only hope from us as well. 
Too many Christians forget that fact, and they consequently end up acting very ungraciously toward others in an attempt to maybe straighten them out or clean them up. I grew up in a very conservative environment, a good Bible preaching church, fairly strict parents, very strict grandmother. <laughs> they had a lot of rules for what it meant to be a Christian. And whenever I would see somebody smoking, I would immediately judge they can't be a Christian. That person drinks, they can't be a Christian. This, this person over here, they, they, they're engaging in premarital sex, they can't be a Christian. I was very judgmental because I knew that there were rules that came with being a Christian and demonstrating my Christian faith. The truth is, though, that we just cannot expect righteousness to ever be embraced by those who are enslaved to sin. The Bible says Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers and confused their ability to reason on a spiritual plane. The Apostle Paul once wrote to the Corinthians, he said, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, and he can't understand them because they're spiritually, uh, they are spiritually discerned. In other words, you can't judge a non-Christian because... He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't understand what, it, what, what following God in holiness really means. And in our zeal for God's truth, we learn to hate sin. And rightfully so, because the Bible declares the wages of sin is death. But unfortunately, though, we do not always make a distinction between sin, which God hates, and sinners whom God loves. And we end up hating sinners instead. Consequently, as Jesus instructed his disciples, we need to be careful not to judge one another lest we also be judged. In fact, Jesus indicated in the Lord's Prayer that the very measure of grace we extend to others will be the same measure that we receive from God himself. In the Sermon on the Mount, he was, he was teaching his disciples about prayer. And he said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know how the prayer goes. And it comes to that part that says, And forgive us our sins or our debts as we forgive our neighbors. And then he stops right there and he says, For if you don't forgive your neighbor his sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you yours. He ties the way we act toward others to the way he will act toward us. Graciousness is something he expects from us because of the grace he has shown us. Christians have always struggled with that delicate tension between law and grace, though. In the first century, there were many within the church who tried to insist that the new Gentile believers should be required to adhere to Jewish Sabbath and dietary laws, as well as the covenant of circumcision. And so this insistence on strict observance of the law caused quite a rift in the church, even creating a wall of tension between the apostles Paul and Peter. Nevertheless, God showed them that they must learn to embrace in fellowship all those who were saved and not put an extra yoke of law upon their necks. Now, I think we've all struggled at some point with similar legalisms in the church. In fact, the Wesleyan church, being a part of the holiness tradition, it was known for many years for its rules. My, uh, my wife's parents would not wear a wedding ring because it was good holy people were not allowed to wear jewelry because jewelry was showy. It was, uh, it was not being humble. Um, I remember uh, 
uh, you know, being told when I was young, you, you, uh, you, you didn't go to the movie theater because movie theaters were, um, that's the devil's playground, you know. Um, well, you could go roller skating maybe, but no, that's dancing on wheels. Um, let's see, what else? I mean, you know, rules upon rules upon rules. We, we have them, don't we? And, and, and we've learned to judge because of rules. But the truth is, whenever we focus on the law in respect to others, we end up binding ourselves to it as well, and we miss the true meaning of grace, which is that God loves you. Not because you deserve it, but even while you were a sinner, he gave his one and only son to die for you. You see, grace is a deliberate act of the will. A deliberate act of the will. The essence of grace is that it is freely given as a conscious and deliberate action of the will. We must make a choice whether to express love and kindness toward others. Not because that person is deserving, just like we weren't deserving from any love for God, from God, but pre precisely because they're not deserving. The story goes that there was once a young man in Napoleon's army who committed a deed so terrible that he was worthy of death. And the day before he was scheduled to stand before the firing squad, his, uh, his mother went to Napoleon and pleaded for mercy for him. And Napoleon said to her, woman, your son does not deserve mercy. I know, she answered. If he deserved it, then it wouldn't be mercy. Hmm. In 1 Corinthians 13, we find a beautiful description of love that I believe epitomizes the essence of grace. Love is described there as being patient and kind. Not envious, not boastful, not proud, not rude or self-seeking. And it's further described as not being easily angered, keeping no record of wrongs, not delighting in evil, rejoicing with the truth, always protecting, always trusting, always hoping and persevering. I, I love that That beautiful description of love. And I would often, whenever I would meet with uh, engaged couples that were preparing for their wedding, I would always go through that with them. And I would ask them this question. You know, when you, when you hear this description of love, I want you to ask this question. Are these feelings or are they actions? We always think of love as being something we feel. But those are actions, aren't they? I have to decide whether to love or not to love. I have to decide whether or not I'm going to keep a record of wrongs or forget about it. I have to decide whether I'm going to rejoice with the truth. <laughs> These are all decisions that we make. Everything in us is screaming for justice, for vindication, even a measure of vengeance. But God says, wait, remember grace, love one another as I have loved you. You can because I've given you my Holy Spirit who lives in you and through him you can decide to live with grace. In other words, we choose whether or not we'll be patient and kind and forgiving and trusting. We decide whether or not we have a right <laughs> or we have to be right at the expense of our relationships. The truth is, we'll probably love more people into heaven than we'll ever influence by any other means. And that's interesting because the image that the world has of Christians is of being angry and hateful. But they're going to be more influenced by the love we show 
than by our anger toward their sin. A generation ago, Pastor Steve Jogren and his congregation in Cincinnati turned that city upside down by modeling the grace of God. I, I went to one of his conferences when I was a pastor, and uh, he was sharing with us all of the various things that he and his congregation did in modeling grace, and I was blown away by it. Uh, I'll give you a little list here of some of the things they did. Uh, keep in mind, this is a northern city, so uh, w when they uh, uh, would go around and, and uh, uh, shoveled walks and push cars out of snowbanks and things like that. You don't identify with those. But a single mom's free oil change. Or a neighborhood windshield washing. <laughs> just take your, people would just carry their window washing stuff and they'd see the cars all lined up on the street and they'd go wash their windows of the cars. Um, and then put a little sticker on it and said, God loves you. Um, and uh, here's one, <laughs> here's one that, they sent us out from the conference to go and, you know, take a couple hours and go do some of this. <clears throat> the one that he suggested that I tried was cleaning public bathrooms. I took my little handy bucket of cleaning supplies, walked into the neighborhood uh, uh, gas station, and I asked the owner there if I could clean his restroom. Have you ever been in, in ugly bathrooms in restrooms? Yeah. He looks at me with this, are you kidding? Why in the world would you ever want to do this? Well, I just wanted to show the love of Jesus today. Have at it, he says. <laughs> but that was demonstrating grace, wasn't it? I mean, think about all the ways that Christians can act gracefully toward others and be known for something different than being angry and judgmental. We need to learn, and, and this is, I, I want to shift gears just a little bit here. <clears throat> As I, as I was thinking through this message, I was thinking there's one thing here that really nails me. And that is this. We need to learn to extend grace toward ourselves as well. Jesus told us that we're to love others as we love ourselves. And I have a feeling that many of us might have trouble showing grace to others because we've not extended the same courtesy to ourselves. And I know a lot about this because I tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist, especially when it comes to my Christian life. As I mentioned earlier, I grew up in a fairly strict Christian environment. My parents, my godly grandmother, my church, uh, the fundamentalist youth ministry that I was saved under, the college I attended, they all expected me to, to toe a certain line. And when I sensed God's call into ministry, that expectation was magnified in my mind. I believed I was saved by God's grace, but I also believed that God was expecting a lot more from me than my performance showed. Have you ever been there? That old report card phrase from my grade school days began to haunt me. Not living up to expectations. You ever have that feeling in your spiritual life? Throughout my ministry, I think I was fairly good at showing grace to people. I was, uh, I was an optimist and I generally believed the best rather than the worst in people, regardless of how they behaved. And I was quick to forgive whenever someone wronged me. But unfortunately, I was very slow, very slow, even reluctant to ever forgive myself. I know God forgives other people of their sins and failures, but how could he ever forgive me? I'm supposed to be better than that. I guess I'll just have to keep trying to do better. 
What a huge load of guilt and condemnation that results in. Well, Paul addressed that very feeling when he wrote his letter to the Romans because after telling his readers about the frustration of living under the burden of the law that they could never fully obey, he remarked, What a wretched man I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? And that's what it feels like when we live under that condemnation of never measuring up. But at, uh, he goes on in the next verse to declare this. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation. Not a burden of death, but no condemnation. And then at the end of that chapter, he makes one of the most beautiful declarations in all of Scripture. And I've got, I've got to read this. It's just, it's just electric. <laughs> uh. What shall I say in, regard, in response to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. That's glory. You know, whenever I read that, I am reminded over and over again, it's not about how great a pastor I am. It's not about how good a husband or father or neighbor I've been. It's not a, it is about how God loves me through the death of his son and that nothing can separate me from that love. Should be an amen on that one. I mean, are you still there with me? Okay. It's, it's not about that. Okay, listen, as a, as a pastor, you know, I confess that I have been on the receiving end of a lot of ungrace at times. And I think every pastor would testify to that fact. Churches are made up of people. If it wasn't for people, everything would be great. But... <laughs> um, and over time, having, de having dealt with a lot of critical people, my passion and love for God and for ministry began to fade. You know? That's why you really need to pray for your pastor. Because he's constantly under that barrage, not from you good people, I'm, I'm sure. But he, you know, the, the, const, the, the things I'm talking about here, that, that sense of condemnation, pastors deal with it all the time. And it's why you really need to pray for him. You know, I, I, I really felt condemned by the words of Jesus to the Ephesian church in Revelation 22 that said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And no matter what I did, I couldn't muster up that first love. 
But then the words of today's text hit me like a boulder. Love comes from God. It's not about you mustering up more love. Love comes from God. He loved you first. And because of his love, you're able to love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Worship team can come back up as I finish with this little story. In a short article by Tony Campola in his book, uh, Stories for the Heart, he, uh, he cites a, a play called Raisin in the Sun. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But it was about an African-American family that inherited $10,000 from their father's life insurance policy. And so the mother dreams of the opportunity to escape the ghetto life of Harlem and move into a little house with flower boxes out in the countryside. And the brilliant daughter of the family sees the money as a chance to live out her dream and go to med school. But the older brother pleads for the money so that he and a friend can go into business and then he can give the family all the blessings their hard lives have denied them. And against her better judgment, the mother ends up giving the son the money. And when the son returns home to explain the situation that the friend ran off with the money, the daughter lashes into him with a barrage of ugly epithets, calling him every despicable name she can imagine. And when she finally comes up for air, her mother interrupts and said, I thought I told you to love him. And she answers, love him? There's nothing left to love. And the mother then responds, there's always something left to love. If you ain't learned that, you ain't learned nothing. Have you cried for that boy today? I don't mean for yourself and the family because we lost all that money. I mean for him, for what he'd been through and what it done to him. Child, when do you think is the time to love somebody the most? When he done good and made things easy for everybody? Well, then you ain't through learning because that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at his lowest and can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. And when you start measuring somebody, measure him right, child, measure him right. Make sure you done and taken into account what hills and valleys he done come through before he got to wherever he is. Folks, that's grace. That's grace. Love that's given, especially when it's not deserved. It's forgiveness that's given when it's not earned. It's a gift that flows like a refreshing stream to quench the fires of angry, condemning words. How much more loving and forgiving is the Father's love toward us? And how much more is the grace of God for us. I'm going to sing that beautiful hymn penned by John Newton so many years ago. Amazing grace. John Newton understood grace because he'd been a slave trader. But God got a hold of his life. He was dramatically converted. So when he says, God, you know, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, he understood he wasn't deserving of God's love and favor. You and I aren't either. But God loved you in spite of who you are, in spite of what you've done. He loves you. Because God loves you. He says, now you show my love to others. You be my grace to everyone you come in contact with in the world. Don't be known by judgment. Don't be known by criticism. Be known by love. Be known by grace.